Well, summer is the time that many of us go on road trips with our families or our friends, and uh, we might go towards the mountains, we might go through the prairies, and whether it's a, in a truck or a minivan or on a motorcycle, you've probably gotten to a point where someone around you in the car says, wow, look. And so you, you search out the window or around you in the landscape for something fantastic that they've pointed out. But the problem is we sometimes miss those things that people are looking at and pointing at because we don't actually know what we're looking for. Instead, what would be help, helpful would be when someone says, wow, look, a bear, or look at that waterfall. Then when you look out the window, even though you've only got a few seconds, you know what to look for. You know its size, its shape, its color, and even the location of where it might be found. Because you have an idea of what you're looking for, you can find it. And, and when you don't have any ideas and you're just looking, most often than not, you're missing what you're supposed to see. And I think that's sometimes how we read the Bible. We come to it, we read through it, we look at, at what's there, and yet we're not quite sure whether we're seeing what we're supposed to see because we're not really sure what that is. And so what I want to do this morning as we drive through Colossians, this book of the Bible that we're going to begin looking at over the next coming weeks, I want to give you exactly what to look for so that as we open it, each time we do this, every week, we're going to know what it is we're looking for and that we'll be able to see it a lot easier. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, please turn to Colossians, the New Testament letter. It's about in the middle of the New Testament. It's called Colossians. And as you do that, I just want to tell you that there was a city in the ancient world called Colossae. That's where the Colossians got their name. And a church had been formed there. And over time, over about 10 years, uh, 10 years later, Paul is writing to this, this letter to this church. And the problem that he's trying to address, what he's writing them to, is to help them try to figure out what the secret to spiritual growth really is. And already, just by understanding that, we know that this book is going to be applicable to believers like you and me today. The issue that these Christians had who had believed the simple gospel uh, and, and received salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. They had that. And, and the problem now was that they were 10 years down the road and they were now wondering, okay, what else do I need to do? How else do I continue to grow in my faith? And I'm not sure if you felt that way before over some period of time, but this is the question that they were wrestling with. And this is exactly what Paul writes to them about. They're, they're looking at, okay, I got faith in Jesus, but what else? What else do I need to continually grow in, in God? And wanting to grow in spiritual wisdom and the knowledge of the will of God and in order to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, this is a good thing. This is what we all ought to do. But they were beginning to try some new things that sounded like they were a good idea. They didn't sound like they contradicted the Bible. They didn't, it didn't sound like they were, they were, it was wrong or that it was contradicting anything that they had already learned. And so they were thinking, why not give it a try? And this was what was going on. They expected that the Christian life was more. It would be more than just obedience to Jesus and faith in Jesus. They were looking for something else. They, they had that, but they began to think, well, that's a little bit too dull over time. That's a little bit too ordinary, too regular. It's not going to help me continue to ascend in spiritual growth. And so they began to look for other things. They were thinking that it would be, that the Christian life would be something more extraordinary, something more remarkable, just something more than simple faith in Christ. And this kind of thinking left them susceptible to the ideas and the philosophies and the traditions that were circulating Colossae at the time. I want to stop here and just say that this is something that I can relate to. And it's highly likely that this is something you have thought about and felt and wondered about before as well. Ten years later, after this church was formed, this is where they were at. And I don't know about you, but have you ever thought, you know what, there's got to be something more. How do I reach the next level of my spiritual growth? If you remember back to the outset of your faith, when you remember coming to grips with how far you have fallen from God's righteous requirements, 
how, how deep sin runs in your own life. And then you heard the gospel, the good news of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. You thought, he died for me to save me from my sins? That's the best news that I could possibly imagine. And just through simple faith in Jesus, we received, with, with mustard seed-sized faith, we received immeasurable grace, infinite mercy, resulting in unspeakable joy and gratitude in our lives. You probably remember those days. But here we are some time later, and the joy and, and the excitement of, of that time has now waned, and you're wondering, well, what's next? I'm not as spiritually passionate or excited. I want to be. So what is it that I need to do to, to, to keep growing in my walk with God? And I felt this way at different times in my life. And I wonder if you have too. So what do we do? What do we do when, when we're not spiritually excited or that spiritual growth seems to be happening on the fly all the time, just continuing to increase? What do we do when that takes place in our, in our lives? Well, I think we begin to think that moving beyond faith in Christ is the next step. But what do we add? And maybe you've tried things that other people have tried. They go and they get a new book and it talks about, it promises to enhance with this new activity or this new spiritual practice that it will enhance your relationship and your walk with God. And so you set out to try that. Or... Maybe you, you know of, a, of another church where more spiritual things seem to be happening. It's more exciting. It's more entertaining. And so you want to go and try out a new church. Or there's um, a new prayer that promises to tap into God's power more than the regular prayers that you're used to praying. Or maybe there's some secret biblical knowledge that you need to know or else you won't, you won't go beyond where you are. Or maybe there's a, a special diet that you need to go on. Or there's places where you need to worship. Or, or there's activities that you need to do. And, and without any of those things, you can't progress further than where you're at. There's ideas and philosophies and traditions all over the place in our world that give us this, this promise that this is what you need. And yet the question is, why do these appeal to us? What is it about them that make us think that, yeah, I'm going to try that. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I mean, it's a good desire to want to grow in our faith. It's a, it's a thing we're all supposed to do. And yet, what is it appealing about this is that it seems like something we can do. That we can just make it happen. That it, that it does make us appear wise. It does make us appear more godly. And so what's wrong with it? And the problem is, is that so often... And perhaps more often than not, these things are just man-made, self-promoting, and they're not rooted in Christ. And, and this is exactly what Paul wants to tell the church in Colossae and the church of Strathmore today. I want you to look with me at chapter 2. We're going to jump around a little bit just to give you the roadmap of what to look for in Colossians. And let me, let me show you how this develops. Look with me at chapter 2, which speaks of this, this issue most directly in verse 4. Paul, the, the writer of Colossians, explains the problem that he seeks to help them wrestle through. He writes, I'm saying this, or I'm writing this, in order that no one may delude you, that is to deceive you, with plausible arguments. So these believers were being lured, being persuaded into other ideas, things that are, that are wrong. And they said, this is where you need to try it. This is what the people of Colossae are doing. Or try this, add this into your faith in Christ, and you will continue to grow. They were reasonable to them. They thought, yeah, you know what? This could be a good idea. So why not give it a try? And Paul, Paul warns them in verse 8, if you jump to verse 8 of chapter 2. He says, see to it. He said, make sure, be on guard, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to, look at this, human tradition. This is, this is man-made. According to the world. This is the way the world thinks. And then it says, not according to Christ. So if we are to try something new, to, to, to grow in our, in our faith, we need to make sure that it is according to Christ. And there are many things out there that are not. There are ideas out there in Christian bookstores, even in churches, that are promoting things that sound completely reasonable. 
you, you could you could hear this and say, well, I got no issue with that. The, the, nothing seems wrong with pursuing that. But I want us not to forget that it's not. Some of these things are not according to Christ. And I want you to remember that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. And so if something sounds reasonable in this in this topic, in this idea of pursuing further growth in our spirituality, in our walk with God, if something sounds reasonable, it doesn't automatically mean that it's right to do. I mean, think of your think of what saved you. How did you be saved? So many people so many people have tried so many different things to save themselves and yet the way that we are saved is by faith in a lowly, weak, and dying Savior. That, that looks like foolishness. That looks like weakness. And yet that's the way that God has chosen to save us. So we remember that 1 Corinthians reminds us that the foolishness of God, or what appears to be foolish, like a dying Savior, is, is wiser still than any human. And the weakness in the cross of, of God is stronger than any human. And so just because it sounds rational doesn't mean it's right for us to do. And this is something that the Colossian Christians, decades after the resurrection of Jesus, needed to be reminded of already. And this is what we, the millennia later, need to hear again and again. And so I want to ask this question, what is it that these people were thinking Oh, that's good. I'll try that. What was persuading them to think that that's the way to spiritual growth? We're going to go that route. We're going to try these things. What were the ideas that were circulating at that time? Well, if you look at chapter 2, verse 16, it speaks of, it says their food, specific food and drink and festivals and a new moon and a Sabbath. And so there were certain things, certain days, certain times that they were supposed to observe jump down to verse 18 and it mentions that they insisted on asceticism or worship of angels which sounds very spiritual or even having visions and so all of these ideas here they sound spiritual and they don't give us the specifics but we don't need them to understand that basically what they were doing was adding a bunch of rules particular things you need to do on certain days perhaps is that that's how you grow spiritually that's how you reach the, to become spiritually elite in the church. You're supposed to eat this food and don't have that drink and go to that festival and make sure you do certain things on certain days. And you're supposed to afflict yourself in these ways and even worship angels, the right angels, and seek visions. They claim that these things would set them apart from all just the, the regular Christians that all they have is faith in Christ. Some of the Colossians were still discerning whether they should do this or which one they should try. And others were already beginning to embrace these forms or some form of spirituality and growth in this way. And if you look down to verse 20 in chapter 2, you see that they tried, they're starting to do this. Paul asks them, why are you submitting to regulations? Like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are the kinds of things that they were beginning to try and then he says in verse 22, he describes these as having been birthed according to human tradition, human precepts, human teachings. These are man-made religious rules. They are not from God. They are from the world. Again, we have to take our cues from the Bible. How does the Bible instruct us in growing spiritually? These are not the way to do it, he says. They do truly make us appear more spiritual and more wise and more godly, don't they? And But they're man-made, they're just religious rules, more laws that Christ has come to save us from and to work in us in his own ways. He advises us, uh, Paul does, that they are of no value in stopping our continued battle with sin. And that's what we're saved from. We're saved from sin and now we battle against it. He says none of these things are going to help you with that. They're all external and they do not help you on the internal battle within your heart. Because think of it, if this did help you defeat sin, if any of these kinds of things did it on their own, then why don't sinners just stop sinning? And it would subsequently render Christ useless if we could do it ourselves. Why not just try harder? Why not just 
to exert more energy every day and you can stop yourself from sinning. This is the way to become holy. Just try harder. And it would tell us that, that the eternal plan of God, the incarnation of Christ, the, the crucifixion of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ is utterly useless. This is the problem with it. And the Bible reminds us in Galatians chapter 2 that if righteousness were possible apart from the law, and we could do this on our own, then it says, then Christ died for no purpose. And we don't need Christ at all. These kinds of methods that we have tried, that others have told us about, we need to make sure that they are according to Christ. Because they only, many of them only act as a spiritual veneer, but they don't actually pr present, they don't actually help us with a true reality of breaking the power of sin in our lives. In other words, anyone can do those things without faith in Christ. Anyone from any religion can do this, can do all of these things. That's the appeal here. I'll just go and do it. But it doesn't require faith in Christ. But the Bible teaches us that only in Christ, only through Christ, only by Christ, can we actually grow in our spirituality, in our walk with God. For He is the only one that can take away sin. And He is the only one that can make us holy. There is only one remedy for sin. And the history of mankind's efforts to try to save themselves has only reinforced this issue that we need a Savior that is not just like us. We can't do it for ourselves. We can't do it for others. And so our Savior must be more than merely human. Our only hope was for God in His great love and in infinite mercy to condescend to our level and to do all the work necessary to save us from our sins and that we would just receive it by sheer grace. That is the only way for us to be saved. And that's why He sent His Son to die. And it's there in the cross of Christ that He not only endured the wrath of God that we all deserve, but He broke the power of sin so that we don't have to be and we are not any longer slaves to it. And all who turn away from, from sin and toward God through Christ, because of what Christ has done, receiving what He has done for us and who He is, we will all be saved. And so salvation and the Christian life begins with faith in Christ. And we all know this, but it does not end. It never ends. It doesn't stop there having faith in Christ. More than the guarantee of eternal life, which we have received, is a promise, or the promise, of a changed life. We're not just saved and then we just live our lives and we just keep going until one day God saves us and takes us to heaven. That's not how it works. He promises not only to save us in the future, but also to redeem us, to change our lives now in ways that we can grow spiritually, in ways that we can actually see it and feel it and know it. Instead of just receiving and taking from Christ forgiveness and righteousness and, and a living hope from our Savior, we are completely indwelled and inseparably united with our Savior. And that changes everything. So much so that we are united with Christ that Galatians 2 says that it's closer than even a husband and wife becoming one flesh. Paul writes there, it says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So, so Christians, the moment that you put your faith in Christ, believing on Him, you stopped relying on everything you're trying to save yourself, and you turned to Christ and said, I need Him and all of Him to save me. And that is all I will hope in for my salvation. When you did that, instantaneously and radically, Christ's Spirit was united to yours, and your life was changed forever. And that doesn't mean that you don't exist anymore. No, simultaneously, Paul says, he continues there, the life that I now live, so Christ is in me, living in me, and the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So Christ is living in me, and I am living my life, and we are so united together that we are now one. And what this means for all who believe, who are in Christ, that means that Christ is in you. And no doubt you've heard language like that before. Christ in you, you in Christ. This is common Christian language. 
But what benefit does it bring to us? We already got salvation, right? We already got the forgiveness that we needed. Why do we need Christ united with us, to us, in us? Well, it means that the being eternally united to Christ means that we are now one. And at the very least, to be united to the Son of God means that everything that He has is now ours. And that, Ephesians 1, uh, verse 3 says, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is true according to the Bible. This is what we believe, and yet we seek other things to help us grow in Christ. We, we pursue other things, adding to faith in Christ and our, un our unity with Christ. And this extraordinary truth, we can't even begin, I think, to, or come close to fathoming what this really means for us. But if it's true, what more do we need beyond Christ? We, we look elsewhere when we already are united to the one who is and has everything we need. We are saved through him. We are united with him. And we are becoming like him. And all of this happens by him. By him, in his spirit, in us. And this is exactly what Paul wants to tell the Colossians and us today. That if it's not Christ, it's nothing. It must be according to Christ. And so we need to see and know Christ more than anything else. I want to give you some examples that we need to be careful of what it is that we seek in, in terms of spiritual growth. He says in chapter 2, verse 6, he addresses them on how they ought to grow. It says this, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so at their salvation, how you received Christ by faith, simply by faith, he says, so, or in the exact same way, walk in him. So you receive him like that, you continue in that. And this is exactly what uh, this, this he continues to say. He says, don't leave him. Don't add to him. Remain in him. Just have faith in Christ. That's how we are to walk. Verse 7 continues. He says, look, root yourselves in Christ. Build yourselves up in Christ and establish your faith in Christ. So you see that everything we need, that salvation comes through being united to Christ and therefore everything we are called to be, everything that is required of us is found in Christ and being carried out through Christ and we are united with Christ. This is a mystery how this happens by faith and yet it is the truth. We have everything we need. And so to emphasize Christ's sufficiency, to say, is Christ enough? Colossians emphasizes Christ's supremacy. I want you to read with me Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And as we read this, I want you to listen to who Christ really is. And, and when we're done, I want you to tell me what we need to add that Jesus can't do for us. I want you to read this with me. Verse 15 of chapter 1. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him or through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That's Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. See, that is who Jesus is. That is who you have been united with. That is why all you need is Christ. Christ is all. So he's greater than anything else that we can pursue to seek spiritual growth. We can try all these things, certain foods and drinks and festivals and visions and any other thing that you could add or try to seek spiritual growth. But if it is not Christ, it's nothing. 
That's what Paul wants to tell us here. This is how we continue. We don't just start with faith in Christ. We continue in it our entire lives. And by faith, you are already united with him. Those things can't add. Those things can't enhance anything with our relationship with Christ. What Jesus has done and who we now are in him is everything. Christ is all. And therefore, in chapter 1, verse 23, there it explains what the church in Colossae and the church in Strathmore needs to continue to do in progressing toward the perfection that God has called us to, this real changed life, the life that we will receive in full and be perfected in when He comes again. Rather than go and add something else, Christians, Paul instructs them to simply continue in your faith in Christ. Make yourself, it says, stable there, steadfast in Him, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that saved you. That is His encouragement. That's how we mature in Christ. That's how we pursue the life that God has called us to. And in chapter 2, verse 19, it describes Jesus as the head of all the believers. We are His body. And if we are not connected, if we don't remain in Christ, in the head then we won't just do, we won't just not grow, we will die without that connection, without that life of Christ. So as we drive through Colossians over the next coming weeks, what you and I need to be on the lookout for as we look out the window and we come to this book again and again is the glory of God in His Son, Jesus. And the more we see Him for who He truly is, the more we will grow in Him. And 2 Corinthians says this amazing thing. He tells us the secret of spiritual growth. He says there, by beholding or looking at constantly, by looking to, by beholding the glory of the Lord, we all are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. By beholding the glory of the Lord. And how does this work? In 2 Corinthians continues, it says, Because the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go anywhere else but Christ. There is no secret beyond Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the secret. And in in chapter 1, verse 27, Paul writes there, he says that the mystery is Christ in you. So that all those who are in Christ are to simply continue in Christ. Why? Because Christ is all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And your word is Christ. And I pray that we would let, as Colossians 3 will say, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. I pray that as we seek you, we want to remain connected, established, rooted, knit together in Christ. We thank you that by faith you have done all the work to save us and you give it to us freely for salvation. That we are forgiven, we are righteous, we are sanctified, and yet in this life, until the end of our lives here on, on earth, you want to change us. And we want to grow, we want to pursue you in growth not only for our own sake, but for the sake of the world, that we would know and live and proclaim the truth and love of Jesus Christ, and that we must just look to you. I pray that you would guard us from the things that this world may appeal to us, may persuade us with, and may we be so richly uh, infused with your word that we would know what is right, what is according to Christ, and that we as your people in this church would continue to seek you always to remain in you and to trust not to be not to be drawn away by these things that seem to be better seem to be more effective but would we trust your promise that christ is enough and christ is all we need thank you for sealing us for the day when you return by giving us your spirit that is christ's spirit And as we are united to him, I pray that we would walk in a manner that is worthy of you, our Lord.
thank you for teaching us this. And as we look in through this, this entire book of Colossians, that you would continue to reveal this, show us more, grow us just by looking at your word, which points us to Christ. And we pray that you would continue to sustain us as we go, not only for this week, but as we are not gathering. I pray that you would continue to help us to grow, knowing that we have Christ and that we would pursue one another, not just to to catch up, but also to grow in Christ together. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the weather that you provided for us, but most of all, that we as your people can worship you in spirit and in truth, wherever we are, but thank you for this opportunity today. And I pray that we would leave here encouraged and blessed and in our heart set Christ as our highest priority as Lord. Christ is all. Thank you, Father, for Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.